So let's open up with a word of prayer. And uh, again, we've got quite a bit to get through tonight. I, I should explain I forgot part three, so I don't have that to give out to you. So my apologies, I, I'll uh, have it next time. Next week, we've got graduations, so obviously we have to skip next week. Um, I don't think my wife would be very happy if I was here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Father in heaven, I pray, dear Lord, that you would bless us tonight with uh, clear thinking, uh, with a biblical approach, with um, just help to understand uh, all of the material that we're going to go through, to ponder it, to see how it applies, and uh, to reflect on it. Uh, I pray, Father, for clarity for me and uh, for wisdom for us all. Uh, bless any uh, that may be late, Lord. I pray that you uh, keep them safe on their way here. And uh, just pray that you would be glorified and exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, uh, I did quite a lot of work on uh, psychiatric drugs. I prefer to call them psychotropic drugs because they are mind-altering. Um, <clears throat> they do affect the frontal lobes of your brain. And all of these, whether we're talking about the prescription drugs, uh, all kinds of prescription drugs, antidepressants and the painkillers, you know, the powerful ones, they all have about the same effects. They all kind of numb the, the frontal lobes. And... Uh, produce all kinds of, of changes within the, the body as the body tries to, to cope or, or deal with this strong alien drug that's come from outside, messing up the chemistry inside, you see? And uh, illegal hard drugs do the same thing. In fact, uh, evidently, there's hardly any difference between some of the very strong painkillers like oxycodone and so on, and heroin. Very, very little difference between the two things. And um, somebody on the drugs task, task force, who you guys know, you know, told me that. Which means that, I think I said this last time, it means that, that people who have been put on painkillers, uh, strong painkillers, you know, for a valid reason, once they can't get those painkillers anymore, they find themselves hooked or they've still got the pain, well, where do they get the help they need? They go often to heroin. Many heroin addicts were formerly on prescription drugs. And so we ought to kind of think about these stronger painkilling drugs and the antidepressants too as kind of gateway drugs to the illegal hard drugs. Uh, we don't, often don't think of them in that way, but, but they are that, uh, do have that effect. And understandably, I think, as well. Uh, in fact, I was talking to somebody this morning at church who is on these strong painkillers, the uh, oxycodones, and she said, I should be taking three a day, but I'm only taking one a day because I don't want to get hooked. And that's very wise. She has a lot of pain, but she, has to, she just has to put up with some of the pain in order not to get hooked to these stronger drugs. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of questions uh, right now, when I, but yeah, I'll open it up for questions uh, later. Um, there are all kinds of things that, that we could go through, and some of it would be more, um, more apropos than, than other things as far as uh, what would be helpful to know in a counseling situation. If you were talking to somebody and they were on these strong pres prescription drugs, you know, they were on Paxil or Luvox or... Um, um, 
oh, I can't think of them all, Zanac and Prozac and, you know, there's a whole bunch of them, and or the painkillers, then um, it's important to know that and to know just a little bit about how powerful these drugs are. And the fact that, uh, you know, it's easy to get hooked onto them, that they do produce effects, and including the downer effects, when you, you don't get them anymore, you get real downs. You go down really badly. They also tend to, uh, to uh, stop you up as far as the digestive system is concerned. So there's that pain problem as well that comes from, um, from not having them anymore. All kinds of issues, the uh, side issues, that people who take these things and get hooked on them have to deal with. Or they, you know, they, it causes pain. So um, as my friend told me, you know, he, he said that a lot of these people that he comes across, a lot of these uh, people who are on drugs, he said they're hurting. They're hurting. And they just take the drug to stop hurting. And if they have more money, then they can take more of the drug to get the high. So it's a, it's a terrible existence, you know, for a lot of these people that get hooked to it. Coming off them is very difficult, and you certainly shouldn't come off them without medical supervision. So as Christian counselors, our business is not to tell a person who is on these drugs to come off them. Now, I have heard of Christian counselors, biblical counselors, who have done that, that's dumb. That gives biblical counseling a bad name. And it's quite honestly stupid. God gave us doctors, okay, for a reason. And guess what? We're not medical doctors. I don't think any of us are medical doctors here. So um, they know what they're doing. They are the people who can help bring a person off and monitor their, you know, their um, coming off the drug. <clears throat> and it is good to come off these drugs. Uh, a couple of things more from this book, America Fooled by Timothy Scott. There's the book. Um, I spoke a little bit about uh, chemical imbalance, the myth of chemical imbalance last week. Um, most people think, including many psychologists, that the problem with a, a person who needs to have these drugs, you know, say they're depressed and so on, is the chemical imbalance. You've all heard it. But it's nonsense. It's nonsense. There's no proof. For chem there is proof for chemical imbalance once these powerful drugs have been introduced to the system. Why? Because they stop certain processes, the body, you know, producing certain... Um, uh, secretions and, and, and certain uh, enzymes and so on and so forth, uh, hormones and so on, they, they stop the production of some of those because they kind of replace them and they short-circuit short them. Does that make sense? And then when you come off, the body is used to not producing and therefore does not produce uh, these needed chemicals to, to maintain the balance of the system. Um, there are all kinds of, of I, I don't want to go into using all of the different uh, tags and labels here because um, they are kind of, you won't remember them and they're hard to remember and it, it's not really that important. All you need to know is that the idea of a chemical imbalance is not true. But on pages 58 and 59 of his book, America Fooled, um, Scott asks this question, is it possible to measure serotonin and dopamine levels or not? And so I'm going to read this little thing to you. It's about uh, two pages. But since he knows what he's saying and I don't, I want to use his language. So please just allow me to do this. Um, and, uh, well, just listen. 
What you are about to learn is not understood by as many as one in 100 physicians in private practice or one in 100 practicing psychiatrists. <clears throat> For years, I did not understand the measurement issue I'm about to explain. I read the leading researchers declaring that serotonin or dopamine levels had never been measured in a living person's brain. Both are easily measured following death by removing some brain tissue and doing chemical analysis of the tissue. If that were true, then all the drug companies' literature and advertising claiming depression and other mental disorders were caused by too little serotonin, depression, or too much dopamine, schizophrenia, were false claims. Yet I had read hundreds of articles which reported changes in neurotransmitter levels relative to various events. I know he gives you the findings on, uh, earlier on in the book. These articles all seem to say that those who claimed neurotransmitter levels could not be measured were simply ignorant. But these were research, uh, these were research giants. They could, how could they be ignorant of the hundreds of studies I was reading? You see the dilemma. I tried to reconcile the two positions but could find nothing that did so. Not even books and articles on neurotransmitters or PET, uh, SPECT, MRI, or fMRI imaging. The frustration was real when I finally decided there was only one option left. I had to prepare a letter which carefully described the apparent contradiction, quoting the authorities on both sides and send the letter by email to about 30 of the world's leading authorities, those publishing research most closely related to my question. Approximately half the letters went out with the subject line being, quote, question from an ignorant psychology professor, end quote. I was, uh, I was, but I was determined not to stay ignorant. Many of those publishing neurotransmitter research using positron emission tomography, PET, or other imaging techniques research frankly admitted they did not know the answer which was a surprise, but some were very gracious and referred me to others whom they believed might know. Others had no difficulty explaining. Here is what I learned. One, relative levels of dopamine can be measured in the living brain. Thus, we can measure whether dopamine levels increase or decrease when a cigarette is smoked, a person is frightened, or a favorite food is smelled compared to a baseline established for that person hours earlier. However, we cannot measure an absolute level of dopamine in the brain of any living person. Only brain tissue analysis following death can determine absolute levels of dopamine. And he also says acetylcholine, acetylcholine, whatever that is. Two, Serotonin measurements in the brain are even more problematic than dopamine measurements. Whereas PET imaging and single photon emission computed tomography, SPECT imaging, are used for relative dopamine measurement, cerebral spinal fluid taps are used to measure serotonin. Three. Chemical analysis of brain tissue following death allows us to compare serotonin levels in depressed and non-depressed subjects and dopamine in schizophrenic and non-schizophrenic subjects. Those studies find that depressed individuals may have high or low serotonin levels and schizophrenics may have high or low dopamine levels. Four, animal studies where the animals can be put to death immediately before or after sleep or just before or after eating, find that eating, sleeping, and other normal activities, as well as stress-inducing events, can raise or lower serotonin levels. It appears likely that anything we do, eat a large lunch, take a brisk walk, get upset, become bored, have an interesting conversation, anything we do will affect our constantly changing brain chemistry. Five, indirect measurements of neurotransmitters are made in many ways, measuring synthetic enzymes, metabolic enzymes, and receptors. 
But even these indirect measurements have serious limitations. The most serious of these is that readings are susceptible to common drugs such as caffeine and nicotine, and that the brain is regularly exposed to radioactivity, having dental x-rays or taking an airline flight. The bottom line is this. Despite the comments in psychology textbooks, explanations in the literature of non-profit mental health organizations funded by drug companies, and what most doctors and the public have come to believe, the, quote, chemical imbalance causes mental problems, end quote, philosophy is marketing, not science. Denmark's leading researcher in this field put it to me like this in 2005, quote, today we cannot quantify the absolute amount of any neurotransmitter in the living brain, but research will probably eventually succeed in doing it if enough time and money is invested in the project, end quote. He then sarcastically added, it would probably require that perhaps 5% of the United States military budget be put into brain scanning research. Um, so I know that's fairly detailed, but I hope that you can see that he had his assumptions as a trained psychiatrist. And uh, once he, he probed and asked all of these so-called experts, they would often say, well, we don't know, but maybe this person knows. And so when he collected all of the data and sifted through it, basically you can't measure these chemical imbalances because dopamine and serotonin keep going up and down in just living beings. So it's a myth. Do you see? It's a myth. And uh, to me, that means that it's probably um, well worth talking to a person about their thought life or their moral life if they have these problems. For example, in depression, which I know very well, um, a person's thought life, really, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, remember, Christ said. Um, if we have a biblical outlook of love towards God first and then others, putting ourselves further down the list, then obviously we're not going to be thinking, woe is me, oh poor me, all the time. We're not going to put ourselves at the center of uh, the uh, interpretation of reality. That's what many of us do anyway. And, and uh, if you're depressed, you tend to do that all the time, okay? You tend to use yourself as a gauge to measure how you're down, down here, okay? And you, you use yourself as a gauge to measure everybody else up here, living their life more fully than you are. Do you see? That's bad thinking. I mean, you've got to change your thinking. You've got to change your values. Uh, you've got to change where your treasure is. Here's Jesus, and, uh, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, where your, do you want to finish it off? Treasure, treasure is, that, where you, that is where your heart will be also. Yes, you nearly got it there. So I'm going to give you another chance in a minute. <laughs> okay. Where your, it's Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. So let's make sure that we don't have idols in our life. Let's make sure that we're treasuring the things that matter. Do you see? Because uh, Paul, Paul in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Set your affections, your mind, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay? So if you're setting your values, your goals, your affections on things above, where God is, where Christ is at the right hand of God, where your rewards are, where your citizenship is, all of these wonderful things which are true of you in Jesus Christ, you've got to make sure that the person that you're counseling, that they're doing that too. And if they're not doing that, and they're almost certainly not doing that, 
They might say they are, but they almost certainly are not doing that, and you've got to show them how, first of all, how they're not doing it, and secondly, how to do it. Okay? And you may, in order to get them from A to B, you may have to get them to deal with sins that are stopping them from getting there. Oftentimes, pride will be one of those issues that you'll have to deal, deal with because people like to present a mask to people and then uh, they, they believe their own masks. Or uh, as one uh, person said to me, he was, uh, or he is, <laughs> um, he used to be police chief here in Ukiah uh, a while back. And uh, now what he does, he kind of specializes in going around training people how to detect people who are lying, okay, just, just micro uh, inflections in their body language and so on, and uh, uh, how to interrogate people, okay? So he's an interrogation expert. And so he, he told me, uh, we were talking about, he's a believer, and we were talking about uh, the issue of pride, and I was saying, well, from, a, from a, an apologetics standpoint, um, you know, I often will teach that a person will deceive themselves and they'll believe their self-deception. He says, well, that's actually, you know, not surprising that the Bible will lead you to that. He says, that's exactly what people do. Uh, the best liars believe their lies. You know this. But he said that a proud person uh, who wants to not believe the reality about themselves will have a picture of themselves that they paint. And everything has its place in that picture. And they believe that picture about themselves. So somebody comes along and they criticize that person. They say, um, that was arrogant, or that wasn't very nice, or you know, whatever it might be. Or that was selfish, you know. And that doesn't fit in that picture. They haven't got a place for, for a selfish them in their picture. So he says what these people do is that they, they straight away, they, they look at that picture that they believe about themselves and you must be wrong because what you're saying about them isn't what they see about themselves. So here's logic coming in, mis being misused. Okay, we reason independently and we misuse our logic if we're, it's not tied to Scripture and the Word of God and won't listen to God. And they think, okay, if the problem's not me, it must be you. You're the one who has the arrogant issue. You're the one who is petty. You're the one who doesn't listen. Is this striking a bell with any of you? I mean, not, I'm not saying, I mean, maybe it, it does convict you, I don't know, but, but I'm not saying from that standpoint, I'm saying from the other standpoint of, hey, I've met people like that. You know, I've pointed something out to them, uh, which is, should be obvious to them, but rather than take it on board and believe it, they go and blame me, and the problem's me. And it's like, how did that happen? Well, um, people are like that, you see. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so it is important that if we're going to bring a person from A to B, we have to also encounter sometimes the picture that they paint of themselves where they believe they're really spiritual. Oh, yes, I love Jesus, and oh, yes, I, I, I love the Bible, and oh, and, and, and Jesus is so wonderful, and, and he's done all of these wonderful things for me, and, and of course, I, my, my uh, affections are set above. They'll tell you all of that, and you've got to ferret it out. No, actually, no, you're talking about yourself, you're talking about things down here all the time. You seem to be full of this world and, and the things of this world, actually, listening, listening to you. Do you see? Yeah, yeah. In order to get them to where they need to be, you often have to deal with the issue of pride. And the issue of pride is actually the thing that's probably keeping them depressed or keeping them in, in the condition which they came to you about. 
So uh, I've got another little bit here. This is later on in the book, page 281. And uh, and uh, two hundred and eighty four. Page two hundred and eighty one. He has a little uh, text box here that that uh, has some book uh, textbook quotes that students learn about antipsychotic drugs. Okay, so I'll just quote some of these that he picked out. Quote, after the widespread introduction of antipsychotic drugs, starting in about 1955, the number of residents in state and county mental hospitals declined steeply, end quote. Quote, thanks to clozapine, Daphne Moss went from hating the sunshine in the morning to loving it, no longer suffering from the paranoid delusion that her parents were witches. Moss began teaching school and living independently. End quote. Quote, drugs have shortened hospital stays and have greatly improved the chances that people will recover from major psychological disorders. Drug therapy has also made it possible for many people to return to the community where they can be treated as on an outpatient basis. End quote. And then finally, where schizophrenia and major mood disorders are concerned, drugs will undoubtedly remain the primary mode of treatment. End quote. That's, a, that's an interesting one. I'll, Say that one again. Where schizophrenia or major mood disorders, okay, bipolar, for example, are concerned, drugs will undoubtedly remain the primary mode of treatment. So if somebody goes to see a psychologist with, uh, and they get diagnosed with bipolar or something like that, then they'll often get referred to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist will what? Almost certainly put them on drugs because that is the primary mode of treatment. And you run into this all the time if you are a biblical counselor. It's like, oh, yeah, I went to see a psychologist and yes, I was referred and yes, I'm on this drug, powerful drug. And it's like, oh my, you see? Now, they can, you can still deal with them and reason with them. Don't think that you can't when they're on this drug. But you've got to also shift the emphasis where they can take responsibility for their thinking and for, uh, for their behavior. I said also that uh, not only was it a person's thinking, but it's also a person's morality is very key. And why is that? Well, because character is all important, you see. I mean, the, the, it used to be thought that character counted, and it really does. Um, not every sort of character. You know, from, from Britain, it's the, the, like the stiff upper lip, you know, don't complain, just get on with life. That's not. There's, there's a dispassionate relationship and so on. That's not good. That's not biblical. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's a truth there. It got twisted, but there's a truth there. Morality is extremely important because, look, if a person does something that is against their conscience and they thought it was immoral, let's say that, that uh, they begin smoking a cigarette. Okay, I remember I was 13 when I started smoking a cigarette. So uh, I remember the first cigarette that I took, I felt that it was bad, I shouldn't be doing this, okay? But I lit up because I thought it was, you know, the, the cool thing to do. Well, I was sinning against my conscience when I did that. And as I continued to smoke, because it was a thing to do and so on, I didn't have a conscience about it anymore, do you see? So I couldn't be called back morally to that first uh, pang of conscience because I'd sinned against my conscience. And it's, it, it takes, therefore, uh, what I've, I've uh, spoken of before, a kind of a dealing with the will to get you back on track. You have to will against your, now your sinful inclination. Do you see? 
Now, I don't mean, when I say the will, I, I should have qualified this a few weeks ago. I don't mean it's willpower. I don't mean willpower, okay? I mean that your will understands what is right, understands what is true, understands what God says, and wants to do what God says because God says it and because they know it's wise and because they know it's true and they know it's helpful. They know it's a movement towards the light and away from the darkness. So it's not just willpower. If it's willpower, then, then are you depending on God? No, you see. And faith doesn't, well, faith is not necessary when you're not depending on God. Faith is the thing that you have to depend on God. It's what links you to God. That's what faith is. Um, so, yes, the will has to be, uh, to, to be trained to do that. And, of course, the more that you do that, the easier it, it becomes. Anyway, to move on here, uh, he will go through the answer to all of these little textbook quotes and say that actually that this, is, this has not been proved to be true at all. And there are problems with it. He gives uh, all kinds of facts and figures, particularly about the drug Thorazine uh, in mental hospitals from 1955 and, and, and uh, onwards uh, to show that, that, uh, it, that there are no real differences, that, that this idea that, that uh, uh, patients and so on you know, are uh, uh, put back into uh, the, the public once they've been been uh, diagnosed with these drugs is not really true, but that there are other issues that are involved. And I, I'm going to read you one more little text box here, if I may, on page 284, that deals with the frontal lobes. And I've already mentioned this, and so um, this is the last bit that I'll do on, on these drugs. So he says this, the frontal lobes of the brain contain much of what makes us human. Therein is found the seat of our own self-awareness, curiosity, drive, will, maturity, aspirations, emotions, and foresight, as the following quotes make plain. And again, I'll just give you a couple of these quotes. As human beings have the largest and most fully developed frontal lobes of all animals, these are considered the organ of civilization or the seat of abstract intelligence. The frontal lobes are also important to insight, one of the primary capacities that separate us from the apes. Next quote. There is no question that the area of the brain that contrib uh, contributes uh, to your sense of self more than any other is the frontal lobe. Next, the frontal lobes are concerned with understanding social and behavioral rules and using these rules to plan and anticipate the consequences of one's actions. Um, <clears throat> again, um, the, the chap that I was talking to you about who, who's on the, the, the drug force and the, and the police, uh, he said that uh, don't, don't get the idea that uh, these drugs, uh, they make a person crazy. He says that they've already got this in them because of the lives that they choose to lead, okay? But what it does is it emboldens them. It, it helps them to step over the line. So if they've got hatred towards a person, they, their conscience may stop them from doing it when they're sober, okay? But if they've had a drink or if they take these drugs, then that, because it numbs the frontal lobes, and it numbs these, these perceptive apparatus and so on, then they don't have so much of a problem doing it. Um, just think about this. Um, many people who've been taking these antipsychotic drugs for a long time, they find uh, that their emotions are kind of out of whack. So that, you know, somebody says something that's maybe shocking and they're not shocked by it. Somebody says something that's, that, that 
is, uh, you know, everybody else reacts to it, but they don't react to it. Why not? Well, because they're not operating in the way that they should be operating because their frontal lobes are affected by these drugs. Do you see? Again, notice this. The frontal lobes are concerned with understanding social and behavioral rules. So if you affect the frontal lobes with powerful drugs, then obviously the understanding and the perception of these rules, and especially in certain people of certain backgrounds, will change. And they may be emboldened to do wacky things that they wouldn't normally do. Many of these people, as we've said before, who are these shooters and go around killing people in schools and so on, they are often people who went to those schools, they were isolated, they were thought of as being kind of weirdos, and they were socially awkward and so on, they were depressed or they were on these drugs. They were on these drugs. Um, or they were on the drugs and they came off them and they didn't take them. And that produced issues because of the imbalances that you know, take, coming off these drugs or not taking these drugs produces because they're powerful. And as we said last time, the drug companies don't want you to know that. They're the very, very powerful and influential lobby. Therefore, they give money everywhere. Therefore, of course, the newspapers don't publish this. They want to get rid of, of the guns anyway, because the leftist has this agenda to get rid of the guns. So it just suits their agenda not to report the fact that these people are on these powerful psychotic drugs. Oh, oh antipsychotic drugs. So... Uh, two more quotes here. The person with frontal lobe damage inhabits a robotic world. It would not be an exaggeration to say he is deprived of his humanity. And finally, as well as being the place where the will is generated, notice that, the frontal lobes play a role in the way we link our perceptions and our awareness to ourselves into a coherent experience. In other words, this is the area where we attach meaning to life. So if that is affected by these drugs, then obviously the, our understanding of the meaning of life is affected, especially if we've been taught evolution in schools and that we're not important, that we're just really only as important as a snail or a slug or a tree. So the, do you see that the, the, that the information that the world feeds people, and Christians are affected by some of this stuff too, of course, uh, that you've, you've got to kind of know about this stuff. You've got to listen for this stuff and see how they may be impacted. So any questions or anything on this before we move on to another subject? Yes. Ritalin, yeah, Ritalin is, um, um, well, here's the thing. I am not saying that these drugs are not helpful for some people, okay? I'm not saying that, I haven't said that. What I am saying is that they are terribly over-prescribed. Over Why? Well, I read it to you because what is being claimed for these drugs is not based on scientific research, but is based on marketing. These drug companies, which are basically like the big food companies, I mean, they, you know, they own the watchdogs too. Um, how weird it was to come to America, okay? How weird it was to come to America, full stop. Um, how weird it was to come to America and watch the TV and find that these powerful drugs, Zoloft and Paxil and Celexa and so on, these were being marketed to us through the TV set. You can't get them 
unless you go to a physician. But what are the drug companies doing? They're getting customers who will then go to the doctors and say, I want this drug. And then they're also they're marketing to the doctors with, with all of this nonsense, okay, about chemical imbalances and dopamine levels and so on, serotonin levels. So the doctors are saying, okay. Do you see? Why? Because it's a very powerful lobby, okay? That's why you don't hear about the effects of these drugs on these shooters. That's why, as far as the Ritalin is concerned now, they are prescribing it for two-year-olds, the terrible twos. But according to Peter Bregan, who I've recommended that you go to his uh, YouTube channel and you, and you read, or you read his, his books and so on, he says that Ritalin is linked to violence. Not with everybody. Now, I don't know whether it is or not, but he says it is. So it doesn't all go well for the future of America, does it? Putting two-year-olds, how's that going to mess with their brains? Don't put your kid on Ritalin. ADHD, according to the uh, DSM-4, which we looked at in, at Southwestern Seminary when I was doing a counseling course there, um, a program there, um, we went and we looked at ADHD and going through the, the list of, of uh, different things to look for, I could be prescribed as ADHD or diagnosed as ADHD. Me, which is a laugh, you know. Um, I, I mean, really, if, if you're... If your kid is climbing the walls, what do you think? Well, there are two things straight away that you should look for. What would be the first one? Let's, let's just use some common sense here. No, no. no. We'll edit that out. <coughs> What's that? No, what, would you, what should you look for? Sleep and diet. Sleep. Are they, are they getting sugar highs? Are you allowing them to drink these power drinks or these sodas? These sodas are full of sugar. When you go to the doctor, you see that chart on there with the, you know, the drinks and so on, don't you, you see? And these Cokes have huge amounts of sugar in them. You give them to, to a kid, yeah, they're gonna have a sugar high, yeah, they're gonna be climbing the walls. Or if you have them playing video games or watching TV all the time, and then you send them to bed at 9.30 at night, 10 o'clock at night, or whatever. Of course they're going to be climbing the walls. You've missed their sleep time. Common sense very often will, you know, do it for you. Not a powerful drug like Ritalin. So maybe occasionally it might be okay for certain kids, but I think... It's scary that, that all of these kids are on Ritalin. It really is. All right. Some kids, by the way, they just, yeah, they do have an attention deficit. So what? I mean, if you want to call it attention deficit, they have a problem focusing or attending. Is that a disorder? It's not a disorder. It's just the way they are, okay? It doesn't mean they're going to dr uh, grow up to be... Uh, Social miscreants. Yeah, what do we used to use to help kids cooperate in the class? <laughs> Corporal punishment, did we not? <laughs> Moral training. We expected the parents to take responsibility. And when that goes out, well, this is what we've got. Let's give them a powerful drug instead to do what character building used to do. All right. Moving on. 
And I do recommend um, this book, America Fooled. There's another book that's just come out by Michael Emlett uh, called Prescriptions and Descriptions, or Descriptions and Prescriptions, and I've read it. I didn't like it very much. I thought he, was, he waffled too much. He's a biblical counselor, but I, I, I wasn't happy with the book. It's like, the, yeah, come on, put your, you know, land somewhere, say something. It's like he's been influenced by... Um, He's got a, a friend who's a psychiatrist, like he's been influenced too much that way. So I, I didn't bring that book, and I don't recommend the book, quite honestly. Um, Ab Abercrombie has some interesting stuff on that on his website as well. All right. What I want to move on to now, then, is um, basically about character, about uh, spirituality. And we'll start with Jesus again. This is uh, Matthew 6, 30, uh, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God. Susan, do you want to finish it off for me? And he, Go on. I don't know. Susan's going to do it for me. Come on. And his righteousness and all these things will be added Yes, I know you knew it. All right. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Um, this is one of those, it's just power-packed verses. And in fact, uh, uh, one of our pastors at our church, uh, Steve, he has uh, proposed this as kind of the, the, the motto verse of the church. And I think it's, uh, you know, it has a real merit for being that. Seek first the kingdom of God. There's an intention, there's an aim. There's something to go for, something that's good, something that's there, something that's permanent. And his righteousness, not your righteousness. So don't go and try to establish your righteousness. You don't have any. You're a dirt bag. I'm going to say it because I believe it. You're a dirt bag, so am I. Okay, so dirtbags don't, don't go trying to establish their righteousness before a holy God. They say, I'm a dirtbag, I don't have any righteousness, I'm going to go to the one who is righteous to get his righteousness. Do you see? And all these things will be added to you. God wants you to seek him. He wants you to seek him. He wants me to seek him. And this other stuff, Okay, that we worry about and that we are transfixed about, well, that will or will not follow in accordance with God's will for our lives. But this is the important thing. So what I want to do uh, here, therefore, is to uh, go to a good old-fashioned Puritan. This has to be written by a Puritan. Look at the size of it. Um, this is Richard Baxter. Okay, Richard Baxter, you know, never wrote a sentence where he could write a page. And so this, this is his Christian directory. And uh, you think, is it big print? No, it's not big print. Okay, it's, uh, this is about twice the length of Calvin's Institute, something like that. It's fantastic. I've read most of it. Um, the biggest part of it is the Christian ethics part, which is, don't get put off by, by that. Um, ethics is just, you know, about uh, one's chosen morality and way that they should live. It answers the question, how should we then live? And uh, I want to just bring some of this material, just a little bit of it, to us to consider uh, this evening. All right, so... <laughs> Um, let's see, did I, I, I did mark it off. I may have to find my place again because I may have lost it because um, I, I took my papers out, which was not sensible. Um, so just give me a second here. I can do this because we're just going to edit this stuff out, you know. People are not going to know that I was doing this. Um, Uh, 
think I'm here, here or hereabouts. I marked it up specially. Oh, here we are. Oh, sorry, a Christian directory. A Christian directory. Okay, here we go. So here are a few things. I'm not going to obviously read, you know, all of this, and it, it is old English, <laughs> but I'm going to pick out some parts of what uh, what he says. This. Um, He says, this is page 63, though some deluded men may tell you that faith and reason are such enemies that they exclude each other as to the same object, and that the less reason you have to prove the truth of things believed, the stronger and more laudable is your faith. Yet when it cometh to the trial, you will find that faith is no unreasonable thing, and that God requires I'm just going to take off the eths. Maybe that will help me. Requires you to believe no more than you have sufficient reason for to warrant you and bear you out and that your faith can be no more than is your perception of the reasons why you should believe and that God doth suppose reason when he infuseth faith and uses reason in the use of faith. Okay, don't worry. I'm going to unpick that. I'm going to unpick that. It's profound. <laughs> it's like you look as though you've been hit in the face with something. But no, this is this is this is profound stuff. The first point that he's he's dealing with, I hope that you got, is that people come along and they say that there's reason, okay? And there's faith. And that they're opposed to each other. So that if you have faith in something, so let's say um, that you have a lot of faith, okay, in something. If you have a lot of belief in something, the correspondence with reason is that you have little reason. You're not using uh, your rational faculties. So this is the old uh, way of thinking that faith replaces reason. Because if you were reasonable, you wouldn't need faith. And that's very often the way that things are presented in the world, yes? This faith-reason dichotomy. And so this is what he's, he's dealing with here. <clears throat> he says that some people would say that these are enemies, that they exclude each other, and that the less reason you have to prove the truth, the less reason, then what? What's he going to say? The more faith. Do you see? So when you've got a lot of faith in something, God, the Bible, um, and so on, then you're not using your reason. But then he goes on and talks about the fact that, yeah, when things are okay, it might seem that way. But then he says this, yet when it comes to the trial, when it comes to difficulty, you will find that faith is no unreasonable thing. It is faith that's going to right the ship. It's faith that's going to give you the perspective that you didn't have. It's faith that's going to allow you to see what you didn't see before. Do you see? And faith is also going to guide your reason of what to do. Does that make sense? Now in my, yeah, so in my apologetics class, I mean my real apologetics class, not the apologetics and worldview class, I don't know if I did this in that class, um, but in my apologetics class I, I spent time talking about the fact that, um, that you, you must have faith going before your reason. Because your faith in God 
will be a true north for your reason to spot and to follow. If you put reason before your faith, can you see what you're doing? What, what are you? What have I said this is our default position? Independence. So you're being independent, okay? And your faith is following you. You see? So you think, you got, I've got weak faith. Yeah, you do. Because faith is not out front guiding you. Now, it's not. You can have faith in the wrong thing, yes? The wrong God. You can have faith in the wrong book. But if you've got faith in God uh, through the Scriptures, you have faith in the truth. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is, uh, sorry, by your truth. Your word is truth, John 17, 17. And so the word of God believed is the thing that writes your mind, enables you to see, enables you to understand, gets rid of the clutter and the confusion, helps you to see over what you couldn't see past. Or if you can't see past it, at least you know that God can. And so you rest in God. So very helpful and practical advice. And so he says, God requires you to believe no more than you have sufficient reason for, than what you have warrant for. When you have warrant for something, it means that you can, you can back it up. Um, I'm going to go there. I'm going to do this. Um, so... Um, how should I do this? I use blue, I think. Okay, can you see that? Justified true belief. Okay, justified true belief. So if you have a reason for something, if something is, is logical and reasonable and so on, you ought to believe it, okay? Then all of these three things will be involved in it. You have to have justification for believing something. Okay, for, for what you say is true or what somebody says to you that you ought to accept as true. They have to provide some justification. All right? It's got to be true. You can't, uh, you can't believe something that's not true. You can believe something to be true that isn't true. You can believe, for example, that uh, September 11th, 2001 happened when Clinton was president. Okay? It didn't. Bush was president. But you can believe that it was Clinton. You'd be believing something that was wrong, whether it was untrue. Therefore, you know, your claim to know that wouldn't be knowledge, would it? Because in order for it to be knowledge, in order for you to know, it has to be true. Do you see that? And then also you have to believe it, obviously, because if, if you don't believe what somebody tells you, you can't you won't know it. Why won't you know it? Well, because you don't accept it. In order to know something, to claim to know something, you have to actually believe it. All right? So the, the knowledge claim is always justified true belief. But there is a, a problem that was picked out with this by uh, a philosopher called uh, Edmund Gethier. And uh, it, it had to do with this word here. Uh, what about if you are, um, you're watching a football match, okay? And I mean a, an American football match. Um, and let's say it was, well, 
Tell me two American football teams. <laughs> the Raiders and the, and the Broncos. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I should know that. I've been in this country long enough. I just take no interest in that at all. Uh, so the, 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 I've heard of those two teams, okay? So the Raiders and the Broncos. And um, you were watching it and you saw the Raiders beat the Broncos, okay? So you, you thought you had justification for your true belief that the Raiders beat the Broncos. Little did you know that actually they screened the wrong game. They weren't scre screening you a live game, they were screening you a game that happened maybe a month back, okay? So you were there and you believed and thought you were justified in your belief and in your knowledge, but your knowledge was wrong. And as a matter of fact, the live game that was going on, the Broncos beat the Raiders, okay? So what, uh, what Gettier said, it's, well, this is called the Gettier problem, if you want to know, but, but what he suggested is that you want something stronger than justification. You want something that has warrant for it. And what he meant by the warrant is that this thing, all of the circumstances had to come together to be actual, the actual circumstances that you, in all other uh, states of affairs, uh, can accept as being true and therefore knowledge. In other words, that there was, there was nothing underhand or nothing there to deceive you at all. Okay, what you saw was true at the right time. At the time you saw it, you have warrant for it, okay? You actually did see the live game. Yeah? So therefore, your knowledge of that was reasonable and your knowledge was uh, true knowledge. Well, what does Baxter say back in the 17th century? He says that God requires you believe no more than you have sufficient reason for to warrant you. He uses the word warrant. You have to have warrant for your faith. Your faith is reasonable. God doesn't want you to believe something that's unreasonable. But he does want you to believe what he says because it's reasonable to believe what he says. You have warrants to believe him because he's God. You're his creature. You also have warrant to believe him, Just and this is not an apologetics course, but you have no warrant to believe him, to cut to the chase, okay? Because when you do believe him, you find actually, ah, that's true. That's right. Now I see what I didn't see before. And you say, well, why did you go off onto apologetics? Because truth is one, that's why. Truth is one. So he continues here. You ready for this? Okay. <clears throat> a life of faith is a living upon the unseen, everlasting happiness as purchased for us by Christ with all the necessaries thereto <laughs> and freely given us by God. All right, let's um, paraphrase that a little bit. A life of faith is living, that is living our lives on things you can't see. What does Paul say? Do you remember this in uh, Corinthians? What does he say about the things that are unseen? He says the things that are unseen are, or, the, or not seen, they are what? Eternal, they're eternal, but the things that are seen pass away, okay? So Baxter says, it's better to fix on those things that you can't see, but that faith tells you you ought to believe, and it's reasonable to believe, because your everlasting happiness, which is eternal and yet unseen, because it's future, has been purchased for you by Christ. And Christ, the one who says, 
Old King James, verily, verily, truly, truly, amen, amen, he that believes in me, and, and all the rest of it, yes? He wants you to believe. You're supposed to believe. And he says, with all of the necessaries there too, all of the things that come with it, all of the things that, that have to happen to you in order for you to enjoy everlasting happiness and that which has been procured for you, that is freely given to you by God. How is it freely given to you by God? Did you work for it? No. You just believed the gospel. So a life of faith is God-centered, not self-centered. For it to be God-centered, it has to be Bible-centered. And therefore, if you're counseling a brother or a sister in the Lord, they have problems, you need to get them to believe the book. You've got to get them to believe the promises of the book. You know this yourself. There's no great mystery about this. You know this, that uh, say you're in financial straits. Been there. You're in financial straits, okay? You can't pay the bills. The bills come. You can't wish, wish them away. You can't believe them away. They come. They demand payment. You don't have the money. Ever been there before? Okay? Well, what are you going to do? You can't magic it up. You go to God. You have to believe that he is. Believe that he's there. God, I can't pay these bills. I don't know what I'm going to do. And you think, because you're, you're human, and your, your independence never turns off, and so you think, all right, well, God, I guess you can do it this way, this way, this way, this way, or this way. All right, maybe there's a friend who can, you know, you, you can get to pop by, you know, Maybe there's, there's uh, uh, maybe I can win something. Or maybe there's a relative who'll die conveniently, you know, and leave me something. Yeah, maybe, you, see, you know, we try all of these different ways. But God's not restricted to those ways. He's not restricted to the way we can figure it out for him. He doesn't expect us to do that. He just expects us to believe him and to rely on him. And, whoa. You know that this, God comes through. He comes through. Uh, most, uh, well, no, not most. Some of you know uh, the story that I, that I like to tell of uh, the fact that, that um, in Texas, you know, I was dismissed from my position um, and uh, as, as, a, as a college teacher uh, seminary teacher, um, in an unrighteous way. Um, it, was, it was not rightly done. It was not fairly done. I was not guilty of what I was um, accused of and was cleared by other people who vouched for me at that final meeting, but the president said, well, I can fire you anyway. So he did. I, I actually put him in power, <laughs> which was a painful thing. But, but anyway, I was dismissed. So I, I, here's Gina. She finds out that she is pregnant with our fourth the very week that I'm fired. I'm driving home, call her. I said, guess what? And yeah, I've just been fired. Um... She was actually all right with it because of all of the hassle that had come before that. And um, so I was thinking that, okay, well, I'm, I'm in the right here, okay? I'm, I've, I've not done anything wrong here, so I'm in the right, okay? This person who came in, he came in in a, in a kind of a... Uh, with subterfuge, he was claimed to be a team player. I invested trust in him, which was misplaced. He didn't turn out to be a team player. He turned out to be a control freak. Okay, once he'd been given the power. 
and um, well, he wasn't a totally bad guy, but he just you know was a control freak. So um, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be justified here. All I need to do is trust God. In fact, on the very day that I got fired, I got a big envelope put on my desk. Um, this guy was opening my private mail at, by this time as well. Um, so we, nothing was, came to my desk that hadn't been opened. But this envelope hadn't been opened, and it was from a church in, uh, in Florida, and they were looking for a pastor. So I was thinking, oh, okay, this is God's way of me going to my next position. And, yeah, they were interested, somewhat interested in me, but they didn't end up choosing me. Fair enough. It wasn't God's will. Um, but I was confused. I was confused. Well, what's the point in dropping that on my desk then and giving me this kind of, you know, um, disappointment, you know, false hope? Yeah, yeah. If it's not going to work out. And what on earth am I going to do? I've got a mortgage. I've got a new baby. I couldn't get an interview for a job. I couldn't get a, an interview at Lowe's or uh, Walmart or any of these places. I could not get an interview. Very strange, okay? How long do you think I went like that for? Okay. Approximately eight months. No money coming in. So how did we live? Well, it was touch and go. It was definitely <laughs> nip and tuck. But I would go out to our post box and I would get letters out from former students who would send money to us. There wasn't, they, they had to have contacted the seminary, found out that I wasn't there, found out my address, and decided to send checks to us during that time. Not only did we pay the mortgage, we managed to actually live better for that period than we had when I was being paid for, by the seminary until I've, God finally gave me a job. And then it dried up. The checks stopped. You think I'd have figured that one out? You know, oh, God can do it this way, this way. I wouldn't have thought about that at all. But it was reasonable to not, not for me to figure out how God was going to do it, but it was reasonable for me to trust God. I have to confess here, lest you thinking that I'm a very spiritual person, I have to confess here, I had trouble believing God for that eight months because I was waiting. You know, I, yeah, thank you, Lord, for the checks that have come, but surely next week they're not going to come. Do you see? Yes, that's how we are, aren't we? So I like to describe myself as a little rat, you know, <laughs> like this. You know, I'm trying to get going and God's got his hand on me, so I can't go anywhere. Um, so, so a life of faith is, is, is trusting in God, okay, in, in that way. Listen to this. Knowledge and faith are the eye of the new creature, and love is the heart. There is no more spiritual wisdom, wisdom than there is faith. And there is no more life or acceptable qualification or amiableness, there's a good Puritan word, than there is love to God. I know I need to re... Uh, I, I don't know if I can... I should reword that because it's really so good. But I want you to listen to it. Maybe we can unpack it a bit. Knowledge and faith 
are the eye of the new creature. Well, that's what we are in Jesus. We're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yes? 2 Corinthians 5.17. So we have both knowledge because we have the word of God and we have faith in that God to direct our um, our reason. So those, they're the lenses, or the eye, as Baxter puts it, of the Christian, the new creature. The unsaved person doesn't have recourse to those things. Love is the heart. Okay? So the eyes come from... Uh, knowledge and faith. Love is the heart. There is no more spiritual wisdom, and we want spiritual wisdom, do we not? Than there is faith. So you want spiritual wisdom from God? Trust God. Engage. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't believe just anything, but prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. We are to have a reasonable faith. But faith guides reason. And there is no more life or acceptable qualification or amiableness congeniality to something, then there is love to God. In other words, the life that God has promised us, the life of joy, the life of, uh, of uh, um, spiritual maturity, it runs along the tracks of our love to God. So this morning... I was preaching on that passage in Philippians chapter 1 where Paul, he's confined to a prison cell, but he's not downcast. Even though there are certain people who are preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry, supposing to add to his bonds. But he says, you know what? Christ is preached, whether in pretense or or rather, uh, or sincerely, he says, it doesn't matter. Christ is preached and I'm going to rejoice. How can he do that? Because of this. Because of his love to God. He knows that in that prison cell, he's exactly where God wants him to be. Because he sees with the eyes of faith. And therefore he knows that he's where God wants him to be. Um, one more for tonight, and then we'll. Uh, uh, I've got a passage in Mark that I want to go to. <clears throat> okay, this is page uh, 65. Faith keeps, not keepeth. I'm going to try and get rid of the S, okay? Faith keeps him still upon the heart by continual cogitation, that's thinking, application and improvement as a friend is said to dwell in our hearts whom we continually love and think of. Here he's speaking about Christ and he, he, he starts off uh, several sentences above this and says that, it, it is not a forgotten Christ that objectively comf- comforts or encourages the soul, but a Christ believed in and skillfully and faithfully used to that end. It is not a forgotten Christ that objectively, I mean really, actually, comforts us. but a Christ believed in. And so upon that, speaking here about Christ, he says, faith keeps him still upon the heart. Who? 
Christ. Okay? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Faith keeps him upon the heart continually by continually thinking, by continually applying the truths of Christ. For example, um, when you're hard up for cash, go to the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Because Jesus here will tell you, okay, that um, you are to, to trust in him. Where, where is it? Don't care for anything, you know? 625. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you, how you'll uh, clothe your body and so on. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Can't pay the bills. Don't worry. The birds don't worry about paying the bills. Well, they have bills to pay, but, but God knows you have bills to pay. So don't worry about it. That's faith. Faith, that, that's an application of what Christ says, do you see? To your circumstances. So as a friend is said to dwell in our hearts, you know, somebody who's a bosom pal, as I used to say, somebody who is very, very close to us, whom we continually love and think of, that's the way Christ should be to us. <clears throat> I'm going to say one more, quite one more. Page 67 here to... To find so little knowledge of God, so little love to him, such cold desires, such wandering and distracted thoughts, such dull requests. Man, that describes me quite a lot there. It is hard to have lively and thankful apprehensions of God's acceptance of such defective, lame meditations or prayers, but we are apt to think that he will abhor both them and us, and that we can take, he can take no pleasure in them, yea, that it is as good not to pray at all. Here faith has full relief in Christ. Two things it can say from him to encourage the fearful soul. One, that our acceptance with the Father is through the merits of his Son, and he is worthy, though we are unworthy. If we have but the worthiness of faith and repentance and sincere desire, Christ has the worthiness of perfect holiness and obedience for us. And a bit further down, too, that all the infirmities of our souls and services are forgiven us through Christ. He has undertaken to answer for them all and to justify us from all such accusations. That's beautiful stuff, and it's true. Okay, why read the Puritans? Because you don't, if you you don't find that nonsense, or, or sorry, you don't find this this stuff, this gold, in the nonsense of, of the modern books. That's why. Mark chapter 7, I believe. No, no, was it, did I say 7? 4. Mark chapter 4. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, verse 35 and following. On the same day, verse 35, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Okay, let's just, uh, this is, this is uh, we're talking about reason and faith here um, to, to close off, Okay. And that faith has got to guide reason. This is what we need in our own lives, and this is what we tell somebody who we're counseling. We've got to get them to believe God. 
and to engage their faith and let their logic and their reasoning go behind their faith. So faith is the light. Faith is the guide, the pilot. <clears throat> so faith guides reason. Let us cross over to the other side. All right. So Jesus intention has been stated. All right. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him, and a great windstorm arose. All right, so number two is an obstacle to faith. In this case, it's a squall, it's a storm at sea. The waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling, that kind of storm, that kind of obstacle. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. You ever thought, God, you seem to be asleep. While I'm suffering, you don't seem to be doing anything. Okay? So three, it appears God, um, well, we'll just be blunt about it, doesn't care. I'm in trouble. I'm in desperation. God, I've prayed to you. Why aren't you doing something about this? Are you not hearing me? Devil comes and whispers in your ear, you know, under the stress and strain that you may be under. Well, maybe, you know, all this stuff that's in the, this book about God, maybe he's just not like that. Maybe it is just you. So he's asleep in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. That tells us that the Christ who is asleep in the midst of the torrid elements is master of those elements. He's just not bothered by them because he is the Lord. I mean, he created the, the wind, he created the sea, he created the whole shooting match, okay? So if he's saying, let's go to the other side, then if he's in the boat and you're in the same boat with him, you're surely going to be okay, aren't you? Even though you get buffeted. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. They didn't need to be a great calm. They could have got to the other side in the squall. Please see that. It would have been a bumpy ride, but they could have got to the other side. And then Jesus would have got some sleep. He said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? All right. So number four is... Faith found wanting. Now, maybe I shouldn't put it that way, but what I mean is that their faith is tested and it's, it's weak or it's not there. Why are you fearful? How is it you have no faith? Let's turn that around. If you had faith, you wouldn't be correct. Now, who are these people? They're what? Yeah, but what's the occupation of some of these guys? They're fishermen. So they know this sea, don't they? They know about these squalls. 
So isn't it perfectly reason reasonable, using their autonomous human reason, their independent reason, they know they're in peril. There's a reason for them to be fearful. No, there isn't. No, there isn't, because Jesus is in the boat. Okay? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be and even that even the wind and the sea obey him? Um, Jesus is awoken. He rebukes the wind and the waves and then he rebukes the disciples for their lack of faith. Okay, what's the lesson? Well, faith in Jesus is where, that's where faith needs to be focused. If faith was on him, they wouldn't be fearing the elements. Outside circumstances can mute faith or test faith and maybe cause it to weaken and, and lose its focus. Classic example is Peter, isn't it? Okay, just tell me to come out of the boat, Lord, and I'll, you know, I'll walk to you and I'll be fine, you know, just come on. So he comes out, starts walking. He's walking on the water. He's doing a great job there. Uh, it's Jesus that's holding him up. But then he has to, as he's walking on the water, the water is catching his attention because it's, it's water. It's rising up and it's, you know, it's being, doing what water does. And he's starting to look at this and thinking, hey, you know, underneath me is just water. The laws of physics tell me I shouldn't be walking on this stuff. I should be sinking. And so he starts to sink. And Jesus lifts him out. Third, not to have trust in Jesus, get this, is unreasonable. Do you see? It's unreasonable not to trust Jesus. It's unreasonable not to trust God. If your reason is guiding you not to trust God, that's because your reason is not being guided by your faith. And so you're all a tiz because you have no true north. You have no anchor. It's just you. And the circumstances are too big for you. So four is simply this. Faith guides reason. Or to put it a, in a more Puritan way, reason is a servant of faith. Okay? Reason is a servant of faith. Now, folks, as we close tonight... Um, if you can counsel somebody, if you can talk to somebody and get them to that place, you will see that nearly all of their issues, all of their problems, all of the that can be done for them will be achieved. Honestly. Now, if they have depression, chronic, you know, bad depression, they have learned certain ways of thinking that they will have to train and put effort in to, to, uh, to make their faith go in front and to follow what God says and just trust, okay? knowing that it's reasonable to trust, even though they don't have all of the answers, even though they, they fear for a relapse or something might happen and so on. They, they nonetheless engage their will to believe, to trust God, because it's reasonable to trust God. It's unreasonable not to trust God. So they do that, okay? Because they have been like that for a while, their bodies have responded to the way they've been thinking and so they have certain maybe aches, pains, certain uh, habits of the body, like 
finding it difficult to get out of bed in the morning for a depressed person, okay? Habits that they've been used to doing, getting up, cup of coffee, you know, aimlessly going to the um, couch, put the TV set on, you know, whatever, instead of going to the Word of God, instead of going to prayer, yeah? They're going to have to unlearn that stuff. They're going to have to create new habits. Their faith is going to guide a new way of thinking. Do you see? But they will come out of it because their faith will guide them out of that and start to give them different mental furniture than they had before they started trusting Jesus. Yeah? That is biblical counseling in a nutshell. And it is in a nutshell. All right, there's a lot more to it than that, but it's, but that's basically what we're trying to do, and that's what we're supposed to do with ourselves too, isn't it? So we can, you can, be a biblical counselor. Many, uh, in many biblical counseling courses and, and many books on biblical counseling, uh, these people who, some of them like Ab Abercrombie and so on, I, uh, Dr. Abercrombie. Um, told me he used to have a, a, uh, his own consultancy and uh, offices and other people working for him, psychologists working for him and so on. And he realized one day, you know what, this is not in line with the word of God. And I'm not helping these people. I mean, I'm helping them a bit, but not a lot. And they keep coming back. So he's decided to throw it all off. This is what he told me. Throw, I'm just going to turn my back on this. I'm going to use the word of God. And he found out that, hey, guess what? The word of God works. And so his, uh, his ministry is a very valuable ministry because he's, you know, he has um, found this out by personal experiences. His book, by the way, it's called Wonderful Counselor. I strongly recommend it. Ab Abercrombie. You can find it on uh, Amazon. I, I'd recommend that you buy that book. All right, any questions? Uh, I'll put it, yeah. Like Abercrombie and Fitch, as was. Um, Ab Abercrombie. Excellent ministry. Um, yeah, I strongly recommend his ministry. Yes, yes, because, you know, sometimes you can change your circumstances, but many times you can't change your circumstances, but you can change your attitude to those circumstances. And again, Paul's a great example of that. You know, he's in a prison cell, but he's rejoicing that Christ is preached. But he, you know, he could have had the opposite view. I'm in a prison cell, so I can't do anything now. God's forgotten about me and all. Yeah? He could have done that. Yes. I found that in my experience that I can choose contentment. You can choose contentment. Yeah. Godliness with contentment is great gain, Paul says. Yes, you can choose contentment, but you can only choose contentment by doing what Baxter tells you to do here, or what the Word of God tells Baxter to do, which is to set your affections on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. The other thing I found, especially the last few years, is that to love God, to truly love God, is to trust Him implicitly and know that He doesn't make mistakes. 
Yeah, to love God is to trust him implicitly and know that he doesn't make mistakes. And then I start thinking that, oh, yeah, this is unfair. It shouldn't happen. You know, then I'm just, you know, I'm being God instead of letting him. Yes, you see, as as soon as you go away from that, you disengage yourself from that, you cannot be content. And as soon as you disengage yourself from believing and trusting in God, whatever the circumstances are, um, then... Obviously, then you've got to find another alternative that God doesn't provide. And that's where the devil has you. You know, you become bait for him. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's most important that we train ourselves because, our, 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 like I say, our default is to be independent. So we've got to constantly correct our course, constantly, back to Christ. Okay. And remember, God loves us and has the very best for us. He just is that best. He has the very best. I I don't want to. I mean, I I agree with you, but but I think that can be so misinterpreted that God has the very best for you. Um, well, your child dies. You know, and you you had a tragedy. Okay, not so long ago, and and uh, or you, um, you know, you lose the job, your career that, that you had sought after for years and years and years, and and uh, you can't feed your family, or I mean, these these terrible things that happen. You get persecuted by, you know, extremists and and so on. Um, it's hard to, to tell yourself in a reasonable, rational way, okay, that this is God's best for you. You see? So it's okay. That works as long as things are, you know, uh, the way that they more or less should be. You're not being uh, attacked at that very moment or people that you love are not being hurt or or persecuted or or, uh, threatened or whatever. But there is a great truth to what you said as well, which is, I'd like to put it this way if I may, and you can disagree with me, of course, um, that where you're at is where God has you, and that's where God wants you, and that's where you should want to be. That is why okay? Yes. Yeah, Do all because things... Because he is all yes. Yeah, so Philippians 2, uh, verse 13, says, uh, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God that works in you both to will and do of his own good pleasure. And then the next verse says, Do all things without murmuring and disputings. Yeah. Okay? Because God can't work in you, okay, both to will... And do if it's a good pleasure if you're murmuring and disputing him all the time. Do you see? Yes. Who am I to say that what God is doing in my life is not fair or it's not good? Yeah, well, that's Job learned that lesson, you know? Job learned that lesson, you know? Um, that was my husband's favorite book, believe it or not. Was it? Yeah, Tim's, Tim's favorite book. Well, Tim, you know. Um, um, Tim passed away with Lou Gehrig's, yeah. yes, and uh, you know not an easy way. But but Tim was a great, a shining example of faith and trusting God and and contentment in his in his trial and in his difficulty, knowing. And this is the great thing uh, you could almost see Tim light up when he would speak about um, his home, his true home, and he was looking forward to to being now where he is. And so, um, yeah, uh, Tim understood, understood that. In Susie talking about God as his best for us, we have Jesus now. Yeah. How much better? Yeah, let me, let me again, let me say something else about that. 
because I, it is important and it's a great truth in, in what Susie says there that God has his best for us. Uh, it, it is very easy to think, well, if this is God's best, you know, when I'm really struggling and hurting, okay, then I'd hate to see what his worst was. And for us to get cynical like that, and because and, it's not easy, this isn't, it doesn't seem like anybody's best, you know? So how can this be best? There's surely better than this. Um, but it is these things that work in us, okay? Our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, work in us a... What is it? A, a more, he uses uh, these superlatives and piles them up. And I can't think of what they are. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, a, a, a more, um, oh, I can't think of it. Weight of glory, anyway. A more sure weight of glory. Okay? They're working for us. And in that way, it's absolutely true to say this is God's best because God counts our tears. God knows us. Uh, at the end of Psalm 40, I'm, I'm uh, poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. Do you see? Yeah. And then, so in that case, that is true. Okay, one more, and then we'll have to wrap it up. This poster, we are constantly being Yes. Yes. Transformation is usually done, and Baxter brings this out as well. That, that it's usually done in by introducing affliction and pain and difficulty into our life. Yes, yes, C.S. Lewis talks about that in his, um, yeah, in a number of his works. Um, C.S. Lewis, The Problem with Pain, he explains beautifully, and we're not really here to be happy in it. No, yeah, that's one of Lewis's, yeah, he says that a lot. He says that's, that's not our purpose. Yes. Okay, yes, one more, Joyce. All right. And it just came to mind, and it was probably about six months before Tim went to heaven, and he actually, it was a testimony, and Pastor Lester actually read it, and he said that it was... Um, it, it, oh, well, I remember him reading that. People would think it was strange that he would thank God for giving him ALS because God got a hold of his heart because he said he had... A lot of head knowledge about God and a lot of head knowledge about the Bible. But when he got Jesus from his head to his heart as a result of getting ALS, he said it was the longest journey he ever made in his life, but the best journey he ever made in his life. I remember that. Yeah. When, where was it? That was at, uh, that was at the, fundraiser that the fundraiser, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. I remember that. It was yeah. June 28th of 2015. Yeah. Wow. He passed away January 15th yeah. 2006. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that well, yeah. All right.